Hello, my name is David Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce here in Singapore. And I would like to start by offering a hugely warm welcome to all of you for joining today's session, uh, which is a flagship event in the Chamber's calendar, our Annual Economic Briefing 2021. This important annual event is delivered in partnership with the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, OMFIF, and today our first panel of speakers will reflect on a tumultuous year for the United Kingdom with both the dual impact of the UK leaving the EU and COVID-19 global pandemic that we're still in the midst of in 2020, um, which then sets the opening scene for 2021. The second act of today's webinar will then lead a panel to look ahead into the changes before us, their implications for trade and the tools at our disposal as the nation entitled Build Back Better. A huge thank you to our event partners, the Fry Group, for supporting this important topic today um, and for the Fry Group's continued support of the Chamber. This has been a long running partnership and to say a few words, I'm delighted to now introduce you to uh, Hugh Wedlock, Director of the Fry Group here in Singapore. Hugh, a very warm welcome, a thank you again and over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, as uh, long-time supporters of the British Chamber here in Singapore, we're really pleased to be title sponsor for this year's economic briefing. Indeed, we've played that role in each of the last 10 plus years. Uh, the, Fry Group, the Fry Group has been giving tax and financial planning advice to UK expats based in, in Southeast Asia since the mid 1960s. But it's unusual during that period that the UK has faced such a long list of challenges. The environment, income equality and recovering economically from COVID and the Brexit process. However, the UK does have Boris Johnson to lead it. And he recently said, um, I have discovered myself that there are no disasters, only opportunities. And indeed, opportunities for fresh disasters. So with that, with that thought in mind, um, we have got a, a great panel um, to listen to this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to them discussing those potential economic opportunities. So I'll, uh, I'll hand back to David. Thank you very much, David, for giving us the opportunity to be title sponsor today. Enjoy the session. David, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much indeed, Hugh. Um, thanks also once again to the Fry Group for your continued support. I think we were saying that it's, it's got to be nearly a decade or just over a decade of support for this event. So thank you once again. So let's get to it. Um, please do post your questions into the Q&A facility on the Zoom toolbar throughout today's webinar. You can also like and upvote other people's questions to help our moderators to identify points which matter most to you and for those that are joining live um, wherever you are in the world today. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce David Marsh, uh, the chairman for OMFIF, to introduce the first of our two panel conversations today, Brexit, the first 100 days. David, it's great to see you again. Um, I can't wait to be able to travel and see you in the UK when we can do that. But thank you once again for supporting us on this fabulous event and over to you. Yeah, thank you, David. And thank you to Helen and all at the Chamber for putting this together. And we're looking forward to looking at this pattern of light and shade that seems to have developed in the first 100 days of Brexit. So I'm going to introduce the panelists now, many of whom you know already. Uh, Ross Walker is the co-head of Global Economics and Chief UK Economist at NatWest. Um, Alicia Garcia Herrero, who's the Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Natixis. And she's got quite a lot to say about the whole security and political relationship between Britain and the European Union. And then Will Oswald, who's the Senior Vice President uh, economics and investment strategy at GIC, who's going to be looking at all this from a more global perspective. And so we've got an hour, as David says, please send in your questions and we'll try to get them all answered. So let's be fairly short and pithy here and information rich. Uh, Ross, first of all, can you tell us about this light and shade? Uh, Britain did absolutely badly, 
bottom of the league last year, according to the economic statistics. This year has come out of the cage with a bit of a roar. If it's a game of two halves, then we seem to be ahead in the second half of the football game. Um, tell us how you think it's developing just on an economic point of view, please, Ross. Well, thank you, David. Uh, yes, 2020 were, were, was not a good year for the UK economy, as you say, on most international growth league tables, the UK uh, is towards the bottom. Now, some of this might relate. There are some statistical quirks around um, how a lot of public sector activity uh, has been classified in the national accounts. But even when you adjust for that, the UK still, I think, certainly underperformed. Th this year has been better with the, the rollout, a fairly rapid uh, rollout of the, the vaccination process. Something like 30 million people have now had their, their first jab uh, I, I still fall into one of those slightly younger age cohorts and uh, I just got my email yesterday telling me to, to register for mine. So that vaccination process has really underpinned the improving sentiment um, and, and improving data around the UK. Though, of course, we start from such a low base that if you look at this, I think, as, as, as you should in, in level terms, you know, UK GDP is still uh, around 8% below pre-pandemic levels uh, a year on. From the beginning of the, the crisis. So the, the damage is still very significant in macroeconomic terms. You know, that's twice a, a typical recession in terms of peak to trough GDP. Um, but we do at least have the prospect of uh, an improving economic outlook. And I think um, certainly in the, the, the first quarter, the current, um, the early part of this year, despite another lockdown, uh, the UK economy seems to have been becoming more adept at dealing with uh, or working around the COVID restrictions. So we'll still see a contraction probably in the first quarter, a drop of around 2% quarter on quarter, non-annualized in, in GDP. But that compares, for example, to a, a forecast by the Bank of England in, in early February, uh, that the economy would, would contract by just over 4%. So in these early stages, I think we, we can be more confident that the growth is going to resume and and as it does, we will have a, at least for a period, the remainder of this year, possibly into early 2022, uh, uh, a period of fairly robust consumer led growth. So we think um, the UK will grow by just over 5% in 2021 uh, and just on partly on base effects, but, but sort of seven, seven and a half percent in 2022. So that might give an impression that Brexit isn't a problem. I, I think that would be uh, misleading or at least premature. I think what we can see with Brexit, uh, there have been early frictions on the trade in good side. Not so much the, uh, you know, pictures of huge lorry jams on, on, on British motorways and, and, and huge queues at ports, um, but more of a, an administrative friction. So uh, you, you can see, for example, uh, many firms, larger firms are identifying potentially significant problems with, with their supply chains uh, because rules of origin content uh, agreements with the EU mean that content in any exports from, from third countries, you are required to pay tariffs on those. And so the administrative process around that uh, is, is adding costs. The tariffs themselves, of course, add costs, uh, but more fundamentally, it's, it's prompting firms to to review their entire supply chains. So over maybe, time- Maybe I could just uh, step in there, Ross, and just ask you connected to that, just as a short answer before then going over to Alicia. Uh, indeed, the administrative um, procedures, people are getting more used to that. More fundamentally, do you think just the fact that Britain has got the vaccination done and that the economic growth will be much better this year than in the Euro area, do you think that will itself psychologically give some kind of a boost to, to the red meat of uh, economic uh, revival. We have seen some rather good statistics in all kinds of areas in the last couple of months. I just wonder whether you think that is going on. It, I mean, it, it will help to some degree in, in the near term. For me, the, the key question is going to be how the UK transitions in the remainder of this year, early 2022, from this consumer-led recovery, which is essentially a a pent-up demand story where, where people are again able to, uh, to, to engage economically, to, to spend money, engage in various consumer leisure services and so on. And then the more fundamental medium-term question about business investment, hiring, 
the, the basic economic structure and model of, of the UK economy. And I think, unfortunately, the, the clarity around what that medium term economic strategy is, is, is still lacking. OK, well, let, let's use that uh, to go over to Alicia. I mean, Alicia, you've got bags of experience also in dealing with Brussels and the whole regulatory scene uh, with Britain's relationship with the European Union, which we have now rather sadly left. So what is your view, Alicia, of the, the mood music? The atm atmospherics have been remarkably bad in, in the first three months. Uh, what does that say about the whole about the way that the economic relationship will pan out, Alicia? Thank you, David. And first, thanks a lot for the invitation. I hope you can hear me well. Um, Very well. Good. So my take on this is that it started really poorly, partially because of, you know, the very difficult negotiations, secondly, because of COVID, let alone the vaccines issue. But I think we need to focus on what has changed and then figure out what's going to happen next. So the starting point is never the end, as you mentioned in, in that football uh, example that you gave at the very beginning. So, so the starting point is as follows. It's really, uh, I'm going to focus on trade, financial, and relations with Asia, economic relations with Asia. The, the, on trade, it is obviously well known, I think. I mean, everybody knows that the, the trade relations between the UK and the European Union are basically at the level they were in the 60s in the sense that there is no single market, there's no customs union. So everything we heard uh, in terms of problems related to rules of origin and so on, basically are a consequence of that decision, which I'm not going to judge, but I think we need to realize that that's where we are. This really means that this relation now is in a way similar to that of Canada or Japan, but the UK is, very close geographically to Europe and very interrelated trade-wise and beyond. So that is what makes it difficult. So it's, a, it's actually a less, it's a worse in terms of uh, trade access uh, relation than Norway or Switzerland. Even worse than Turkey in goods, not in services. So, so now this is the thing that needs to be overcome in the future because I think geography will matter. There will be a time in which there will be a realization that the, the trade linkages will not disappear. And thus, I, I actually think this will be in a way revised, maybe not with the, you know, in, in the spirit of everybody watching, as was the case before Brexit or before the final, um, I mean, the, the, the actual change of Brexit, but, but it will happen. That's my take on, on where we're heading. On financial markets, a little bit the same. Yeah, I mean, we... We barely have a memorandum of understanding. We don't have single pass. We don't have single passport. We do not even have equivalence decisions, which means that if you're a financial institution in Singapore, you may have a better access actually to the European financial market than if you're in London. This makes no sense to me, and for the very same reason, it makes no sense to me. Probably doesn't make sense to many operating from London. And and in that regard, I think it will change. Just to be you know precise in what I said. There is an uh, equivalence decision temporary granted by the European Commission on securities deposit, uh, depositories until mid-2021 and clearing uh, services uh, until mid-2022. I move to the third topic very quickly, which is really about uh, trade with Asia or, or trade and investment with Asia. And that's where we see the divergence. And that divergence has nothing to do with what was negotiated. Uh, it was. It, it is really probably a consequence of, um, as to how the UK and continental Europe are seeing the world today. Continental Europe somehow seems to see the world in a westless way, meaning let's sign a, a comprehensive investment agreement agreement with China. That's the only place you know, of, in the world that is going to grow, perhaps partially because of COVID. Just to remind the audience that this important at least in terms of signal, a, a agreement was signed on the 30th of December. And one month later, exactly one month later, the UK decides to officially apply for CPTPP. That's a very different option. This is ASEAN, this is Japan, this is to some extent even Latin America, Chile or Mexico. So meaning in a way, not China. And I think this is important because 
somehow this divergence in views about uh, the world, or at least Asia as, a, as a, of course, a magnificent part of the world in terms of creation of, of uh, wealth and, and growth, might put us together again. Because I, to be frank, I think that you might have to review this. I might have to go when, back. When you say the, us, it, uh, who do you mean by us? Uh, the UK and continental Europe. Oh, we well, are good. neighbors. I, well, good. We it, happen it, to be neighbors and I, we I know each other that, very well. That's a very intriguing point and a very good way of bringing in Will, actually, because, Will, um, you are assigned for this conference to be looking at this Brexit issue with global eyes. Um, could you comment on what Alicia just said, which is a, a very good point to make, I think, but also more generally, tell us how you think that after the first hundred days has panned out um, in terms of this idea of, quotes, global Britain, end quotes. Uh, clearly, the EU remains, as Alicia has very eloquently said, the most important trading partner. Do you think Britain has basically got the stomach to go out and fight on a world scale and be seen as a really good international player, not just in the EU, but in Asia, not just China either, Southeast Asia as a well. whole? Have we got it in us, Will? I think if we look at the launch that we had for Global Britain, um, within the document itself, it said we need to focus on actions rather than words. So you know, a lot of the narrative that we've had coming out of the UK is broad descriptions over aspirations, you know, clearly a lot of the pivot to Asia. Um, but we really need to see what that means in terms of concrete action uh, from, from this point onwards. Um, I think what was striking about that document as well was that it was almost completely absent of discussion of any relationship with the EU. So it was it very much came across as more of a political document of, uh, of an intent rather than perhaps an, an economic one. Um, there's clearly a lot of challenges within the Conservative Party that still remain uh, also as well. So when we look at uh, you know, the challenges that you've had from uh, some of the arch Brexiteers that are now refocusing as the China Research Group and, uh, and opposed to stronger trade relationships with China, that's a, a narrow path that Boris Johnson will need to tread. But I think when we take a step back and think about what it, it did take as a positive step forward, it was very clear that the UK was trying to align its goals with many of the same goals as the US administration. It sees itself as having to, uh, to really reinforce that relationship, that that was something that was potentially vulnerable uh, coming with the UK coming out of the EU, that it would no longer, if you like, be the US representative um, within those European conversations. They need to ensure that they're aligned on issues around technology, you know, the pivot to Asia, how they will relate to, uh, to China, uh, and these are clearly sort of strong uh, areas of focus from a positioning standpoint. I think if we take a further step back there and say, well, you know, where is the UK really going to offer itself up as an investment destination? Uh, what's its role going to be within the world? You know, we've been invested in the UK for a very long time. Uh, we've we've uh, just celebrate, uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary of our office in, uh, in London. Uh, and as an institution, we've only been around for 40 years. So we've been a uh, long time within the, uh, the UK. And many of those reasons still exist. The UK as, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the legal infrastructure that you have, the skills that you have available within UK universities. You know, there's a broad set of, uh, of opportunities within the UK that are, are attractive. I think particularly given where we are uh, coming out of the, at least some, uh, some certainty as to where we are post-Brexit, you are going to see some of that uplift, uplift coming through in, uh, in investment. You see that within the, um, you know, the Deloitte surveys that you have of CFOs on uh, their intentions for investment over the next 12 months. You look at the Ipsos Mori uh, survey on economic optimism. We're now at the, into positive territory for the first time since 2015. Now you're at the point where com coming out of COVID, there's an opportunity for the UK to seize on that sort of uh, you know, that optimism coming out and to address some of the, uh, the investment shortfall that we've seen over the past few years. Um, and that's where I think some of the longer term investment uh, will still be. So I think you know, if we take that in an overarching context, the UK is still trying to establish itself in terms of the political narrative for how it will operate within the world. What that means in hard economic terms is yet to be determined, but there's a lot of opportunities with investment into the UK, given the environment that you have there, that and it still leaves us as being uh, very positive over the investment opportunities into the economy. Well, thank you, Will. Uh, that's a very good uh, 
uh, eloquent summing up. Can I go back to Ross now? We've got a first question in from the audience, which is very germane to what we've been talking about, from Patrick Flynn. And he says that the UK has shown a lot of nimbleness in terms of getting the vaccinations done. Uh, can we show, can Britain show the same nimble-footedness, uh, decisiveness on competing in the international stage? And I might add to this, uh, Ross, where do you think are the opportunities for uh, British exports and British investments, particularly in Asia? Let's indeed not just concentrate on China. Let's talk about Southeast Asia as a whole. Where do you think are the opportunities for, for British business? Yeah, so my, my, my fears or my concerns for the, for the UK are, are less about whether you know, we can be sufficiently nimble. I think the, the UK economy over, over recent decades has shown that it can adapt and there is a flexibility, but I think you do nevertheless need some form of policy lodestar. And you know, for the last three decades, the, the real the core of the, the UK economic model, its, its, its unique selling point vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world was that you can come and base yourself in the UK as an international business and you can access the world's largest, most lucrative single market. And that meant that the UK became a, a magnet for global investment, everything from Japanese car manufacturers to Korean chip makers to um, in, in global investment banks. And those greater barriers now between the UK and the EU undoubtedly change that calculation. And so the question is really, how, how does the UK become an attractive base for both external global investment, inward investment, and also domestically, given that those barriers to trade are going to be a little bit higher. And what we haven't really seen is anything that you could describe as a coherent strategy, let, let alone a vision. I mean, I, a vision, let alone a strategy. Um, you occasionally get noises about the UK becoming a much lower tax economy. Well. It's very difficult to become a low tax economy when you have a huge European style welfare state. Um, and as we saw in the, the budget in March, the UK is, uh, in order to partly fund all of the, the emergency support during the pandemic, is now penciling in quite significant tax rises from 2023 and getting progressively higher. Uh, and roughly a third of those tax increases will fall on the corporate sector. Uh, including quite large rises in, in headline corporation tax rates. So the idea, sometimes we hear this phrase, you know, Singapore on Thames. Well, whatever the UK becomes, it is not going to become a particularly low tax economy, certainly not by global I, I think standards. they have they have stopped do, saying that, Ross, I have to say, because they do realise what a ridiculous idea that was, given the size of the, 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 the budget deficit. But can I just go on to, Alicia, this idea about... Um, action, not words. Indeed, the government in Britain is well known for quite a lot of bombast. Um, so are you looking for something that actually puts some flesh on the bones of some of the statements? And, and what would you do if you were in the driving seat at 10 Downing Street, um, and given this multiplicity of problems that, that Britain does have at the moment, um, given the fact that we do have a, a very large budget deficit, which has got to be plugged in some way, as Ross was saying, what, what would be your priorities in order to stimulate the growth engine? Well, uh, frankly speaking, I think many countries would wish to be the UK now. And let me explain you what I mean. It, 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 I understand all of that, but at least you have a currency that you can inflate. I don't mean to say that you need to, but you know, not everybody has that luxury. Europe does, but there's many other countries out there that may find it harder. And I think that's what, and I'm not going to go all the way to, you know, Southeast Asia or, say Australia, I mean, Australia is trying very hard to keep the uh, three-year uh, yield curve on, on, you know, uh, on the level they promise it to be, but on the up, uh, higher part is it's just ballooning. So, so actually the UK does have uh, tools, monetary and fiscal tools that not everybody actually has. And I think that's important to realize. On top of that, and I have to insist on this point, the UK has could have, still does, a special relation with a major area. The, the European Union agrees to be, sorry to say, much bigger than the UK. And the UK doesn't have now, but could have any time a much better access, which has had for a long time. 
So I don't think that is useless. It might not be necessarily what is now uh, on the, in that bombastic uh, idea that you mentioned, but it is very useful now. Um, just to give some numbers, I mean, France is going to grow about 4%, Germany 36 according to our forecast. It's not, uh, it's not nothing. It is actually something the UK could ride on. And, and it has a 750 billion uh, recovery plan to enjoy. It could be whether it's investment, whether... So I wouldn't just dispel all of that. And again, going back to the point I made before, CPTPP looks very appealing because the UK could actually provide a platform for the US also to come along. So, it, so I understand that you're worried, but I have to say others could be even more worried than you are. And you I just well, thank you. that I, positive I'm, I'm, note. I'm I'm a lot less worried than I was when I started talking to you uh, three minutes thank ago, Alicia. So thank you for that. But, Will, what do you say about all that? We've got quite a burst of optimism there from Alicia. Could I just home in on one point, China? Uh, as Alicia says, China is not everything. But can Britain play some kind of bridge, do you think, between the European Union uh, and uh, the Chinese when it comes to our trade and investment uh, relationship with China in what's going to be a pretty fraught phase for the whole Sino-American relationship. Can you tell us a bit about that, Will? Clearly, Boris Johnson, if you look back to his time as mayor of London, uh, he's always had a positive attitude with respect to China on, on trade. But it's a very difficult balancing act as they're also challenging China on uh, on the relationship with Hong Kong. Um, you know, to, to the idea that the UK can form that bridge between the two, I, I, I kind of struggle to see the uh, on the Chinese side, um, you know, to re for them to perceive the the UK as the appropriate bridge. Um, but maybe if I could, what I'd like to do just very quickly though is just to come back to you know, the question of what the UK could do. And there's five specific areas that I think actually the UK does need to address that uh, that uh, haven't really been uh, been addressed at this point. So I think the first one is on the skills gap within the UK. So there's been a lot of emphasis on tertiary education. Um, but there's been much discussion over the years over. Uh, you know, what you used to have in forms of uh, polytechnics or more vocational education, that kind of skills gap is an important area that the, that the UK needs to address. Um, I think the second is that, yes, you have world class uh, universities within the UK, but investment in R&D has actually been relatively low. And again, so turning that the quality of the universities into something that you can build on for uh, for industries on top of that in a way that the US has successfully done. Now, that's the second area that I think would be a, a significant uplift for the UK. The third is the national infrastructure strategy, uh, much discussed about that, much discussed about leveling up, not much actually done and delivered. So that needs to get reinvigorated to actually put that together, to put teeth, um, uh, I'm not sure if one puts teeth behind things, but anyway, put teeth on things or whatever way it is that one does with teeth. Um, the fourth one that they, they have discussed a bit more, but still is a structural area of concern for the UK is the lack of housing. Uh, so you do have a chronic housing shortage across the UK that they, partially addressed last year, but clearly has a lot further to go. Um, and then the fifth one, you know, the UK has done very well in terms of its climate targets. Uh, they're uh, effectively not using any of the power from coal, but the share of renewables in the UK still remains actually quite low as a, as a sum of the total. So, you know, I think there's areas there if we're looking at the, the future for the UK, whether it's in terms of you know, digital innovation, uh, the technological innovation that they can build on top of the universities, what they're already doing on leading on the green areas and building on renewables. You know, these are, uh, are concrete steps that they can take to, uh, that they can actually take. Um, and rather than, as you say, some of the bombast that we hear from the UK of talking in these sort of grand eloquent terms to actually put meat on the bones and say, look, these are the actual strategies that we're going to adopt. That's what we need to see coming out of the UK is these sort of more concrete steps. Or maybe we should just put GIC in charge of the strategy and let them get on with it. Uh, but could, could I pick up one of the, the points you just made here, Will, about digitalization? And clearly there's lots of uh, very good opportunities, particularly in areas like Southeast Asia, for British business. Ross, you mentioned that British business as a whole has been more, you used the word adept, I think, in coping with the latest lockdown than it did in the lockdown the same time last year. And indeed, that part of that is due to digitalization, is due to everything from home deliveries to just-in-time production. And so uh, can you draw out a few positive examples from what has been happening in Britain in the last three months? Um, and 
try to uh, extrapolate that onto the wider stage in terms of how can Britain become a leader in the worldwide digitalized economy? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, um, I think we were probably all pleasantly surprised by how well um, tech has functioned from, you know, during, during the sort of working from home process. I think when the pandemic first kicked in, I think there was a concern that broadband networks would not be um, capable of, of, of dealing with the, um, the increased volume, um, connections would be poor and, and software systems wouldn't, wouldn't function. So I think that, that connectivity, um, I think, gives you some encouragement that uh, from an IT perspective, you know, the UK at least starts in a you know, reasonably favourable position. And more fundamentally, the, the flexible way in which businesses have adapted. I mean, you hear lots of anecdotal stories about, you know, airline pilots working as delivery drivers for a spell. Um, I'm not suggesting you could build an entire economic strategy around that, but... but just so long as we don't have delivery drivers working as airline pilots, I, I would be very happy. It, it might not work in reverse so well uh, when things reopen, but it gives you a sense of at least, I think, the flexibility and, and the dynamism that is still there in in, in, in the UK labour market. Uh, because one issue, of course, around Brexit is that we will almost certainly have reduced labour mobility in the coming years. Now, there's nothing, of course, to stop a UK government um, independently adopting much more liberal migration policies. But this was really one of the, the, the you know, the, the, the wounds, that, that uh, one of the, the, the things that really fueled Brexit sentiment. So, you know, there are some questions about whether inflexibility in the UK labour market might result in more inflation medium term. I think the pandemic experience um, suggests that actually there might be a bit more flexibility and, and dynamism on, on the labour market side. Um, and as has been mentioned by others, I mean, the two, the two areas where you do hear you know, a lot more discussion, first of all, the, the tech sector, you know, whereas in a sense, the UK economy is seen as, as being really a, a sort of having finance at its centre as, as the real dynamic. Um, could that shift to, to technology? Um, could the UK become a base for either, uh, at least within a wider European sense, the, the, the sort of large US tech firms and as an offshoot from that begin to develop its own micro businesses? And then secondly, in, in the green uh, space, green finance, green tech, um, all of these things I think could you know, provide a, a basis for a, a modernizing, more dynamic economy. But again, has been mentioned before, these things require a lot of upfront investment uh, and expenditure. And, and that's where the doubts lie. I think the concerns are, the medium term concerns about UK growth really do center on, on the investment environment. And as you say, you know, some of it is about perception. Um, if, if, if the UK can be seen to be performing well, to be open for business, to be a, a pro enterprise environment, then you know, there's no reason why Brexit need mean this, um, the, the economy underperforms over the medium term, but there are clearly going to be big adjustments, which to some degree in the near term will, will inevitably weigh on growth, will reallocate labor. So those problems are, are real. And, and I think we will, we will see them play out probably over, over a decade rather than just a few years. But yes, it's going to be quite a, a long-term struggle. Um, Alicia, you've been quite optimistic about this so far. Could you uh, uh, carry on maybe on the psychological angle because as Ludwig Erhardt might have said at least 50 percent of the economy is psychology uh, even Boris Johnson has been getting a better press in continental Europe uh, in the last few months because of the successful vaccination strategy there's been very noticeable in Germany where I spent a lot of time can that translate through into more jobs growth and investment for Britain and, and can that translate that through to a better economic story do you think um, I think the vaccination success um, was well received in Europe at the beginning, like an example to follow. But I have to say, once people got more data on the share of exports of vaccines in Europe, literally 60 percent, and where it was heading and, you know, all of that, I think that view started to change. And that's just, you know, the, the reality of things. It has nothing to do with your recovery, but I wanted to clarify that there is a long story about the, you know, the, the vaccination issue. So I wanted to clarify. You know, for me, when I said the irony of things is 
I may not have been very clear, but I, I hope I can answer your question with that uh, thing that I really wanted to say from the beginning is that this is a story of separation. So you'd see it on trade. So worse, basically, uh, initial conditions in terms of um, um, restrictions. Same on the financial sector. But what unites us, and I think this is good for the UK down the road, is basically a much more um, turbulent world where we'll have to take sides. And my guess is that the UK and Europe can't take different sides, as simple as that. And that in a way will basically put aside the reasons why we were diverging because they don't make much sense. And that in itself will be a way, I'm not saying the main way, but a very important way for geographical reasons for the UK to perhaps do better than we're now assuming it will. Because the idea is for 10 years, we need to swallow Brexit. I'm just saying that maybe the underlying decisions for Brexit, whether trade or financial services, might change somewhat because of that divergent world in which both the UK and Europe will have to take in my opinion, the same side. Yes, I can, see, I, I can see your point in divergence growing into convergence. Can I just go to you, Will, and put a, another point, though, which would go in the opposite direction. There is this, uh, uh, th this paradox somehow that if Britain is seen to be doing better than the rest of Europe, uh, let's say economic growth this year, that won't go down very well at all uh, in the European capital of Brussels, because that might encourage other re recalcitrant countries to do the same. We've already seen this uh, with some of the holdups, for instance, in the ratification process for the next generation EU, particularly in Poland, even though they're going to get a lot of money out of all this, that they will be uh, rather squabbling about this. So th the very fact that Britain is doing better, it might actually encourage divisions rather than convergence. Could you comment on that, Will, please? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I buy into that completely, just because I think you know, the, the ructions um, that you have between Poland and the and the, the EU are much more about uh, criticism of the rule of law within uh, within Poland and Hungary. So I don't think it's about the uh, you know it's, it's much more fundamental about their their relationships on on that side rather than sort of thinking that they can follow a, a UK model. Um, you know, I don't think the likes of the of Poland and, and Hungary within within Europe would look at the UK and say, well, look, we are economically very similar, that we have a lot of overlap, so we can therefore follow that that route. Um, I think as well, if we look more broadly in uh, in Europe, um, you know, the sort of the uh, the anti EU sentiment that we saw really sort of peaking after uh, the 2015 um, refugee crisis, you know, has diminished uh, fairly significantly. Um, you know, if we look at uh, what we see going on you know, within uh, Italy with, uh, with Lega, who are you know, much less opposed to, uh, to the EU. Uh, if we look at the La uh, Ressemblement uh, Nationale in France, you know, uh, again, not particularly opposed at this point now. So you know, this idea of sort of splitting up Europe, I think, is... Uh, has much less weight behind it than it did, um, you know, at the height of the, the Brexit crisis. And so so would you buy the idea of uh, what Alicia is saying, that in fact there could be a slow process of convergence taking place over the next 10 years as a result of the development that she is foreseeing? Uh, in the sense of convergence between the UK and the EU? Sorry, uh, just to, to clarify. Well, yes, yeah, so I think uh, what Alyssa was saying was uh, also a, a trend of reconverging almost politically, also from that she was saying that it's very difficult for Britain and the EU to take different sides on some big aspects, for instance, China, which we were talking about before. And so rediscovering some kind of common links, even though we're outside, again, another paradox, but it sounds to me relatively plausible. Yes, I think if you look at the the sort of uh, the the overarching ideologies that you have, the UK and the uh, and the rest of Europe have far more in common than they have in difference. Um, especially when you look at something like China, which is seen as uh, you know uh, effectively a, a strategic challenge for the UK in the same way that that, that Europe is being uh, you know cautious. Um, so I think that you know that uh, that commonality of ideas. Um, uh, especially in a sort of a post-Trump era, which is about bringing together 
the different sort of uh, you know democracies around the world, if you like, um, to to have that sort of common framework and ideology on the rule of law that they want to pursue. Yeah, that is going to form a natural partnership that the UK has with the rest of Europe. Um, I think in terms of you know have, setting an example for the UK, I think that the agreement that's come out of the the end of the transition agreement is is, is largely setting that in its place. Clearly, we have a lot further still to go on services and. That's where uh, you know the EU does hold the whip hand because that's the one that matters more to the to the UK. Um, but in terms of the the message that you have to the rest of Europe, I don't think that the EU would be looking at it and saying, "Well, look, let's let's make sure that we we do more to make it more difficult for the UK." I think it will be more of a constructive broadly relationship. It, it, well, I would like to think that is right, and we will get over the atmospheric problems we've had in the first three months over vaccines and and other things. I would like to ask you in the final 15 minutes of this session, please do send in some questions by the chat function, if you have any. Um, Ross, I'd just like to carry on on this green topic, which you mentioned before. It, it As part of the uh, development of Europe, it does look as though the Green Party is going to be playing a very considerable role in Germany uh, after the next election since September. Is that an opportunity where the British and the Germans could be teaming up here in terms of the relationship with the wider world. The, the Greens have got a very long track record in Germany of this, and it look, does look as though they're going to be getting real power next time around. And therefore, they could, if you're being optimistic, be uh, something of a meeting of minds here. I say this, I'm actually partly a German citizen now because I have become both a German and a British citizen. So I'm putting on my two hats here in asking you that question, Ross. Yes, I think this is probably one area where at least selectively you could you could see um closer ties alliances being developed um i mean the uk government i think we have to be careful not to exaggerate their their green credentials um for example we recently saw a um in in, in the north a, a, a coal mine reopened so there's a you know energy policy does have a, a mix to it but there has been a distinct green shift in terms of I mean you're, you're quite right the German the Germans are very good at not carrying out their own regulations I, I can absolutely uh, agree with you on that but sorry for the interruption but you're right there and I, I think one area where the UK might be able to um, leverage some some sort of existing expertise would, would be in the financing of green projects so UK government is um, shortly to issue what they, what they call green gilts um, so the, the, the UK government borrowing, but specifically for uh, environmental related infrastructure investment projects. Um, I think we'll see this also in the corporate space, um, which again raises some interesting possibilities in terms of, of future monetary policy. Um, you know whether those those green bonds might be might be preferred purchases. Um, so so the financing of green investment and, and infrastructure development is is something where Although at the moment it feels a bit like, certainly on the EU side, that the drawbridge has been has been pulled up in terms of UK access to to European markets. It might be that these sort of opportunities are areas where um, relations can be developed, and we can certainly in, in, in the financial services space um, find a settlement that, that's a little bit less restrictive than than the one we have at the moment, which well, that, that's is essentially a, a no thought. deal. That's a very good thought, I, and uh, Singapore would be a, a good place to try to enact this strategy. There is, after all, a, a big uh, Singapore green programme now, Singapore 2030. The MAS has got lots of action programmes on that, so it would be a good way of teaming up, I think, between uh, Europe, including the UK, and, and Singapore. Um, Alicia, I've got a question from the audience, which maybe relates to something I asked uh, Will earlier on, but could, perhaps you could answer this, and it follows on from what we've just, just been saying. Um, do you think any other EU member country might consider following suit? It's a question from Duncan Fraser. Will has partly answered that, but you might like to have a stab at that yourself. And also uh, might make uh, the uh, might make other potential entrants to the EU think again. I expect Duncan is talking about countries in Southeast Europe uh, or Central Europe, for example. What influence does Brexit have on what you might call the third party process? Well, um, I have a very different view from Duncan, uh, or at least, I don't know what he has a view, but the question seems to be uh, phrased as if 
many other, uh, whether Eastern Europeans or, you know, or even say the frugals of the world because they have to pay for the recovery fund would suddenly decide to leave. I actually think we are exactly in the opposite situation, but it's not because of the pains of Britain of financial services, no single passport, no. I think it's very simply because the world is complex now and nobody wants to be there in the cold, uh, out there in the cold. And you can take the example of Kosovo and as you know, this, this uh, one billion loan that, that you uh, was kindly asked to bail in, actually bail out all the, they're not the origin of the loan and the answer from the European Commission. And you can see already quite a few countries kind of uh, hesitating to be part of 17 plus one. That, so my impression, why? Not because the EU has more to offer after COVID, maybe the 750 billion recovery fund is part of it, but I don't think that's the main reason. The main reason is that where to go in this world. I mean, it, it, not, not every country can be Britain. You can have a global vision. And, and I have to say, even for Britain, as I was trying to, um, to, go, to explain before, it'll be hard not to take sides. Well, if you are Poland, if you are Kosovo, <laughs> frankly speaking, there's no way you can do that. So that, that is why I think there's more of a, of a move towards remaining and staying there. Maybe it's not very warm, but it's not as cold. as. Uh, and, and also, uh, as the questioner was saying, adding to the membership. Then. So you think that countries like Kosovo, Macedonia yes. uh, and so on um, are likely to carry on. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Will, another question has come in on China. You've answered a little bit of that already, but p p perhaps you could just elaborate on where the common ground might be with China in this area of green technology and green finance. There's lots of issues where uh, Britain, the United States, Europe, and China might disagree on human rights, trade, technology, all kinds of things, but green area is clearly a common denominator. Can you say a few words about that, please, Will? I think on the technology side, as it applies to, to green infrastructure, that's going to be clearly more challenging, um, just because you know, if you look at how the UK has responded with regards to, to Huawei more recently, um, you know, that sort of change in, in strategy, represents their recognition of the the problems that you have of intellectual property rights with China and so on. So that's going to be a bit more, more challenging. Um, you know, they are clearly trying to tread this very fine line. Um, if you look at the way that Boris Johnson put it, he described China as being a systemic challenge. Um, uh, uh, and that's sort of a, a sort of a rather uh, elusive term as to what exactly it means. But as compared with the uh, very direct description of Russia, which I believe he said was the most acute threat to our security. You know, so he's um, for those countries that he he sees as being opposed to the UK, he's very direct in saying that. For those countries where he sort of sees both the positives and negatives, it's a it's a bit more in in couch terms. Um, now he clearly does see China as a very important trading partner, and that's been, uh, as I said at the outset, that's been a, a long standing position that he's held. Um, they have tried to build some of those closer, closer relationships with China, but specifically as it applies to technology, um, you know, especially if you have the US uh, trying to kind of uh, bring people under its sphere of influence on the technology front, they're likely to tread a bit more carefully on that front and to, to try to kind of partner more with the, with the US, I think, rather than with, with China, just because of the importance of that US-UK relationship and, and keeping that progress that's been made sort of... Uh, I know since the Second World War, uh, keeping that going. Uh, we haven't dis discussed too much the big American stimulus package, um, Ross, but that's clearly going to make a major difference to economic prospects, not just in Europe, but in the whole world. Will we see more talk of this special relationship, do you think? Could this be of some help to Britain that we garner some benefits from this uh, very large uh, package by this new president, uh, uh, Franklin D. Biden, and specifically in the infrastructure area that you mentioned before, is that an area where British firms might be able to gain some benefits? I'm talking also about uh, dealing with Singapore, where there's, of course, a, a huge amount of infrastructure expertise. Could, could the one effect of the US package be a bit of a knock-on benefit for UK infrastructure service providers and constructors? Yeah, certainly. I, I think the the scale of the U.S. fiscal stimulus is is, is going to have material spillovers for other parts of the world. Um, so U.K. exports should should benefit. Though 
as we've seen in the past, albeit in slightly different contexts, um, public procurement processes are often um, still quite protectionist in nature, and it can be difficult for, um, particularly in a market like the US, given the political climate, it can be difficult for, for overseas firms to, to break in and access those markets. But as I say, I think the scale of this stimulus is such, and the emphasis on infrastructure is such that it will mean um, you know, some, some winning of contracts for, for UK businesses. Um, of course, all of this fiscal expansion is going to have a, a price, you know, for that um, um, immediate boost, you are going to see tax rises down the line and probably here and in the US, uh, the corporate sector and the parts of it that perhaps have seemed to have done well during uh, the past year or so are, are almost certainly going to be targeted. So there will be some offset further down the line. But, um, you know, the extent to which politically the UK can forge anything that you could remotely describe as a, a special relationship. I've always been a little bit sceptical about this. I think, um, you know, the UK might have been a sort of prima inter pares, a first among equals in a European context when it was a, a full EU member. I think Brexit makes it less relevant to the US, maybe not so much from a security or intelligence perspective, but, but in pure economic and trade terms. Um, so yes, there may be some upside for the UK, but I, I, I would hesitate to, to view this as a, uh, you know, a, a transformational uh, benefit. Yes, could you comment that on that, uh, Alicia, also in the context of these changes going on in the rest of Europe? For instance, Green Party likely to be in power in Germany after September. They are very much against uh, additional military spending. They're against the um, Nord Stream pipeline, for example. That's going to cause uh, some ructions between the United States and Europe in, in coming years, without a doubt. Uh, what role can Britain play in that, Alicia? Uh, thanks for the question. I understand that the, in the good old times, the Green Party in Germany's main goal was no war, peace and no army. But I think things have changed. And the reason why they've changed is basically China. And if you look at the Greens Party, whether it's the European Parliament, by the way, or uh, the Green Party in Germany, their approach, their vision of China is very negative, which basically can't go along with the view that we don't need an army, we don't, you know, we're all peaceful and, and wonderfully fine together. So, so that's, that, was ha that is an important change. And in that regard, I think that the Green Party in Germany could indeed, going back to my previous point, kind of push continental Europe further towards what I think is, and, and you're an expert in the UK, but my feeling is that the UK has also changed tack and is closer to the US position, maybe not as much, but certainly more than just a year ago. Uh, and I think the EU will follow and the Green Party in Germany could actually be a speed speeding could be speeding up that process indeed yeah well th thank you that's another intriguing point which i think we should feed into the overall deliberations maybe we should uh, do something before the germany elections uh, with the singapore british and the singapore german chamber of commerce will a, a difficult question for you from the audience uh, will scotland seek to leave the uk and join the eu uh, I think there's multiple different parts to that. Um, so first of all, you know, to, to get to that vote, um, the uh, the SNP and and Alba be between them, uh, you know, they need to actually get uh, a clear majority in the Scottish parliamentary elections. Um, uh, the whole, and I, I'm not going to delve too much into the politics between Nicola Sturgeon and uh, and Alex Salmon, but uh, certainly if you look at the the polling numbers, um, you now have a very slim majority of uh, those who would actually prefer to stay within the UK rather than have Scottish independence. So, you know, it's not clear that uh, that, that as a rallying cry is going to hold. Um, I think the related point to that as well is, you know, if Scotland were to want to re-enter the EU, um, first of all, as the fiscal budget stands at the moment, they wouldn't, uh, they, it would take them a while to reapply. They'd have to reapply as a new country. Um, obviously, they're very aligned at the moment, but it would take them it wouldn't be sort of an immediate rejoining. Uh, but in terms of joining the euro as well, you know, they don't meet the criteria to be able to join because they'd have a very large fiscal deficit. So, you know, they'd have to have uh, a, another currency that they are then uh, running in order to, to manage the interim period. 
could they have the sterling as that currency that they use? It's not clear you know, that they would actually be allowed to use sterling in that environment as well. So there's multiple different hurdles to get there beyond the sort of the, uh, the initial vote. Of course, the early, most important question is, even if the SNP were to actually win, the, um, win a, an outright majority in the upcoming parliamentary elections, you still have to have permission from Westminster to hold that referendum. And Boris Johnson has very clearly said, they're not going to allow that referendum to, to be held. So they couldn't actually hold the referendum in, its, in the first place. Um, they'd have to wait until the 2024 election for, um, for that to occur. So I think there's multiple different steps that it's, it's all very well to sort of think they can leave the UK, they can go straight into, uh, into the EU, they can adopt the euro. It, it's not that straightforward. Uh, uh, well, it's a very polished uh, answer, Will. It's almost as though we've been preparing for that, which of course we didn't. So well done for the answer. Just, uh, just we're wrapping up now. So a very quick question to all of you. Uh, we're talking about 100 days of Brexit. Let's think ahead, say, to the next five years. If you were to do a scorecard for how well you think Britain will have done out of Brexit in, in all kinds of very general way uh, it, after five years, if you think of this as like strictly come dancing, can you give a, a scorecard, Ross and uh, Alicia and Will, h how much out of 10 will there be on the scorecard for Britain uh, in year five, uh, five years from now? First, you, it's just a one word answer here. Uh, Ross, your thoughts? Four. Alicia? I think we won't hear the word Brexit in five years. So maybe the score won't be there because, you know. And, no, 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 that's uh, not that's, about that. I'm sorry, good... you're, you're, you're breaking the rules. You have to a, yeah, a number. Okay. Ten. Yeah, <laughs> sounds, that sounds like Brexit. Uh, yeah. I'm breaking the rules. So uh, five, five. Five, five, five. Right, I thought you said ten, five. Right, Will. Six. Fix. Okay, well, good. Uh, it is like Strictly Come Dancing. I think you've done very well. If I had to form a government out of the three of you, which, who knows, Britain might need a new government, I would certainly make Alicia the Foreign Minister. I'd make Ross the Finance Minister. I would put you in charge, Will, as Chancellor, uh, not a Chancellor of Britain. So that is the Prime Minister. I would say you, you are, you've shown Prime Ministerial uh, tact and diplomacy here. here. Uh, here, Will. So, I, I so, 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 any concrete points is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a, a great gathering where we put together this different parts of expertise from the economics, the security, the whole relationship with the EU, uh, and I think have uh, talked a lot about China and Southeast Asia as well. So, we put everything together. We've even got the German Greens into the story. I'm going to go to hand over back to David Kelly, who will then introduce the second panel where Cara will be presiding. So thank you all very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the evening in Singapore. David, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, a fabulous, fabulous panel. Lots, lots, lots to chew. I've written, written loads of notes down. Thank you so much. Um, without further ado, delighted to be able to handle, handle over to our, uh, our, next, um, our next panel and our um, uh, Cara Owen, uh, the, the British High Commissioner to Singapore, will be leading the panel. Cara, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us today um, and over to you. Thank you so much, uh, David, and I'm really pleased uh, to be here. I caught about half of that panel. I was enormously impressed both by David, the previous moderator, who I think has um, acted like a total class act that I'm going to have to raise my game to follow. And also the panel who absolutely coped with all of the questions that were uh, thrown at them. Um, I am, of course, British High Commissioner in Singapore. So one of the things I was thinking of when I was approaching the start of this moderation is uh, if all of the focus is going to be about UK, UK policy and how the UK is doing, I'm going to be in a slightly strange position as moderator. So I can warn you now that there may be some moments where I will actually uh, pass a few comments if I'd like to, um, which reflect uh, UK government policy and my reading of the uh, situation with respect uh, to my role. But 
The main reason that I'm here is not to talk myself, but to actually moderate um, a discussion involving uh, three fantastic panelists. And what I intend to do is to introduce them one by one, allow them to set out some opening statements around the theme of um, building back better. I will ask a, a follow-up question. Um, and then after all of them have made their opening statements, I really, really hope uh, that those of you who are watching will be filling up the Q&A um, uh, with some questions that you would like to be put uh, to the panel. Um, as before, it's possible for the audience to vote uh, against the questions that have been put up by others so that I can get a really clear sense of which are of most interest to all of those that are online. Um, so we're going to be focusing very much um, on uh, building back better. Sorry, Helen, I can, if you can come back to me and then I will go to our lovely uh, panel. Um, just to say a few uh, opening words uh, from me. Um, uh, so sitting here, it's really interesting looking at the kind of interest that I am receiving from Singapore uh, and Singaporeans and the companies that are based uh, within Singapore. Um, and some of the things that I hear that they are noticing about our efforts to uh, build back better. And I really hope that when we come to the panelists, all of them uh, will comment on some of the things that I will just uh, set out here. So I hear people reflecting back to me some of the perceived strengths that we have in the UK and some of the previous panel talked about it, in particular our tech sector, I think uh, our budget, uh, the level of investment uh, that is uh, inside our budget, both in supporting jobs, but also in setting us up to build back uh, better. Uh, new innovations like the Office for Investment, like the super deduction in taxation, that is uh, investment incentivizing, and the panel uh, may like to talk about that. I hear lots of interest in our tech sector. I hear way more interest than I think a predecessor of mine might have heard on investing right across the UK, whereas before uh, sometimes um, uh, London and the Southeast gobbled up all of the um, uh, investment appetite. I really see people looking at growth of uh, interesting new, new companies and uh, new clusters of capability that are all uh, around uh, the UK. And then of course, um, something that uh, I hear people um, noticing an awful lot is uh, our green plan, how, we, how we're going to build back better, and how important it is that that is a very, very uh, green recovery. And we have established a really good track record on enabling uh, a high level of growth while at the same time uh, reducing our carbon emissions. So those are the, some of the things that I'm hearing back from Singapore. And I reserve my right, like I said, to come back and make some of those points uh, in the discussion. But I'm going to turn now to the fantastic panel uh, that we have uh, for you today. Um, a really kind of different panel with uh, different uh, professional backgrounds who I think are going to bring a really rich uh, set of perspectives, uh, challenges, suggestions uh, forward on how the UK uh, is likely to build back better and the extent to which it has a good chance of uh, doing so. Um, Gary Duggan is CEO at the Global CIO Office and CEO at Purple Asset Management. He's based here in Singapore. He has been a high profile investment professional across Europe, the Middle East and Asia for close to four decades. Sorry about that, Gary, dobbing you in on your uh, length of uh, tenure. You've held uh, CIO roles at major institutions across all three regions. And you've got a reputation really for making pretty bold calls on the market. You made a major bear call on equity markets in 1987 at the top of the tech boom and the financial crisis in August 2007 and a bull call on equity markets in uh, March the 17th, 2009. Martina Garcia is currently non-executive director at Haitong Bank. Until last month, she was leading the international markets team at the London Stock Exchange Group and spearheaded the creation and implementation of the Shanghai London Stock Connect. She joined the LSE in 2015 from Goldman Sachs, where she was managing their Brussels representative office. 
Prior to that, she worked for the UK's Treasury, uh, leading negotiations with the EU on the post-crisis banking regulatory framework as Deputy Director for Banking and Financial Services. And uh, Peter uh, Mather uh, has been the G VP Group Regional President for Europe since April 2010. He's simultaneously the head of BP's UK operations. Peter has nearly 40 years of commercial experience as a leader in many aspects of the energy industry. In his current role, he has BP's integrated business development, governance and external government relations across Europe. So welcome to all of you. I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn to Gary uh, to kick us off to make some opening reflections um, on the question of building back better and some of the things that you can see that are most likely to unfold in the UK. Gary, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kari. Car you set me up as being provocative, so let me just start with a provocative thought. Um, I don't like the idea of building back. I think you're. I think uh, the UK has got to think about building forward, and I think it's going to have to be transformational. So I, I would love the dialogue when we talk about uh, this kind of post-Brexit period to be much more confident, much more positive about what can be achieved. And I think it needs a vision. I, I worked in the Middle East and you know, I would say a whole generation was inspired by Saudi 2030. And you can think of the UK going through the same transformational change here, where you've been in one regime, in the case of Saudi Arabia, wholly dependent upon petroleum. And in the UK, significantly dependent upon the EU. And you basically have to point your economy in a different direction. So I think if you have that transformational mindset, then I think the UK is going to be a good place. And I think one of the things that perhaps not been uh, discussed so far in, the dis in what we've heard is that the need to inspire a new generation. Uh, baby boomers and Gen X are still running the agenda uh, politically and of course uh, in terms of captains of industry. But in order to get that tech boom going, in order to get the transformation of the economy, you need the active engagement of people who feel that they've been disenfranchised because they all voted to stay in. And that, of course, is the 18 to 34 year old group. And But those could end up being the millions of entrepreneurs that the UK needs to take it in that new direction. Um, in terms of the um, industry mix going forward, there's clearly going to be a need for change. I, you know, I enjoyed and profited uh, from being in that financial services industry through its massive, a significant change from 87 um, onwards. And it was very, very good for the UK, but didn't necessarily translate into great for the whole economy. So I think that if you think of the financial services industry in the future, and I think it was mentioned on the amongst panelists earlier, I would see it as being an absolute needed catalyst for the support of the entrepreneurs in the UK to make the change. And in being a, a vibrant financial sector, you want to be the capital of capital. You want to be bringing the world's capital into the UK, then to make its way out through the entrepreneurs of the UK into overseas markets and elsewhere. And that brings me on to another thing that the UK needs to get off the hook on. It's this concern about immigration. I think there are certain policies already being put in place to bring some of the most talented minds around the world and they will absolutely be needed and I think if you can bring them to the UK and create a real you know a university of the world uh, to bring the best ideas to come to bear on transforming the UK um, even better but of course it's not just about the highly paid it's also about lowly paid and mid paid and there I think there's a still a significant need for a, again a, another significant jump in the ability to educate and upskill people. And the last point I'd make is, is gen general infrastructure. Yes, the technology works. Yes, the UK has done incredibly well over the last 12 months, considering all the challenges, but it can do more. And I think uh, it's good news that uh, there's an encouragement of investment because investment to bring productivity, to bring growth has been pretty poor in the UK over the last couple of de decades, indeed one of the lowest in G7. So as I say, building forward, I'm all for it. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Um, that was really interesting. So this idea of a, 
a vision, finding a way to have a new type of financial services base, which is about attracting in capital and unleashing entrepreneurship. A couple of follow up questions for that, if I may. Um, what do you think that then tells us about how the UK needs to establish its trading relationships across uh, the world? Um, you know, in the run up to um, uh, the Christmas last year, I uh, um, received a visit from Liz Truss. She was here to sign, I think, something like the 63rd out of a total of 66 uh, rollover trade agreements that uh, we have managed to negotiate um, uh, in the run up to the end of the transition period. And also we now embarked on more um, uh, ambitious and newer uh, trade agreements with Australia, New Zealand, uh, US, um, CPTPP as being one of the most exciting ones in this region. To what extent do you think uh, that is going to support? What else do we need to be doing? What other kinds of new uh, trade policy is going to help um, underpin the vision that you set out there? Yes, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, in, in essence, uh, the UK is going to have, a, have to pivot quickly uh, towards other countries, although I think, again, from the last panel, I'd agree that, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not doing business with the EU anymore, and there's work to be done there in order to smooth the ways, in order to encourage that we still keep a significant market share of, of places where we've been doing well. But, you know, very simply, you know, we export, or the UK exports less to China than it does to Ireland. I mean, there's a very, very simple statistic summarizing exactly what needs to be achieved. And it just, doesn't that sound very simple that we should be able to do better than that? And I think it's probably one, two things to do. One is our clearly relationships with these countries have got to improve. Clearly we've got to open more um, solid uh, relationships and uh, links uh, into the growth countries of India and in China in particular, given the exceptional growth expected from those economies. And then we've got to be just confident that we know what we're trying to sell to these places. I, I mean, I'm just interested in that, you know, the, um, call it the general advice industry that we have in the UK, the consultancy one has been one of the strongest, but I don't think that China or India is ready to be lectured about how to run things. So I think constructive engagement with a number of countries, but I think it's a very good focus on India at the moment, and I think we've got to build bridges with China. Um, picking up that point about uh, lecturing, consultancy, advice, one of the areas where I think we are ahead uh, in the UK um, is around uh, thinking about ESG and making sure that's absolutely hardwired into our economy at every level. We have legislated in certain areas, we're going to be mandating uh, kind of disclosures already. Do you think that's an area that we can show leadership uh, on? Absolutely. And how do you think it will help us bring in uh, other types of uh, kind of exports uh, um, and economic strength behind it? No, uh, absolutely. And I think um, there are a number of good examples across the UK of not just talking about it, but doing it. I think the commitment to the 2030 plan and trying to get rid of the dirty cars and dirty vehicles, I think the build out of battery factories in the UK, again, is very encouraging. And I think the other thing is that, um, as mentioned again earlier, that you know, the idea of green bonds or just funding for green initiatives, the UK could be the global capital of that. It is up for grabs. And so, if, again, if, if the UK pivots to something that's very relevant to the future, and I go back to that age group earlier that I mentioned, and they're absolutely passionate about it, you, you're really bringing in the best minds with the capital and with the UK with a very good credentials and agenda. What do you think could stop the UK from achieving that leadership role in being the centre of green capital? I think if it thinks too much about regulating all of this thing, I mean, I give you an example. We're all sitting here, even in Singapore, very worried at the moment about EU regulations around uh, mutual funds. There's a whole uh, pages that have just been dropped in people's laps uh, from March of this year, making it incredibly difficult to find the right investments in ESG. And I, all, I'd make it very simple by saying, you've got to be very flexible and you've got to keep it simple. And you cannot at this point be as puritanical as sometimes maybe the EU takes it to. 
We, if we just get away from dirty to grey, that will be a significant improvement. But if we keep asking people to be absolutely green today, they're going to turn away from you. So I think a, a more flexible approach to this greening of the world, if the UK plays that role, there'll be certainly a, a dividend to be paid. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Um, Martina, I'm going to uh, turn to you now. Would you like to make some opening comments on this question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I was thinking of focusing also a bit on the, on the financial services sector, yes? And uh, for me, one of the absolutely key priorities right now, I will have, well, I will have three priorities, yes? One is productivity and, uh, and, and technical change, yes? And I would like really to focus a little bit on FinTech. The second is globalization, is this geographical expansion and have a bit of a realistic check of where we are. And then one note on international governance and uh, particularly the way of doing trade negotiations from a, from a financial sector perspective. One on, uh, on productivity. The financial sector is, 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 is quite particular at one level. It has not yet gone through the, uh, if you want, the 80s lean manufacturing is extremely arcane and, uh, and is very inefficient, funnily enough, yes? And I think then at the moment, uh, particularly with the shock of COVID, which has really shown how much we can change and how quickly we can change, it has opened the, the gates for FinTech and to have a productivity revolution in financial services. And I think that's going to be key for the UK to embrace that and for the city of London to really, really, really embrace it. And it has to be a partnership between uh, uh, the uh, private organizations and the regulatory framework. The FCA is uh, very praised around the world for its uh, um, uh, approach to, the, to, to FinTech, but it has to go one step further because we are going to have to change many of the ways we do things, if, for example, uh, on uh, cross-border payments, well, payments in general, but also on settlement and some of the really uh, gritty nitty of uh, 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 financial infrastructure. Then let me say a word of globalization. We all speak about global Britain and, and the city of London is totally global and it's wonderful. But until now, it has been uh, gaining capital from the US and, uh, and the EU hmm, and distributing it to the EU and a few other countries and regions uh, and particularly, I will say then, uh, particularly Africa and the Middle East, more important than Asia. And Asia only represents like what, around 5% of the investor base in London. It's far too small. London is not yet truly global because capital markets are very, very split. I discovered that when I was doing the, um, uh, the Shanghai London Stock Connect, speaking to issuers and speaking to CFOs and the difference of approach, CFOs don't think of China. CFOs don't think of India is totally different from uh, the CEO or the sales uh, director or the person in charge of manufacturing, where well, obviously they think of these countries, yes? So in capital markets, it has to internationalize. And the way of internationalizing that is not just by, um, it has to be about change, being able to change practices. Practices are really very strongly embedded and people think then they know best. I really like Gary's comment about, uh, you know, not wanting to be lecture. Well, it's also adapting. It's adapting in terms of the hours, it's adapting in terms of the culture, it's welcoming Asian culture in the city of London. And I think that's going to be critical coming forward, whatever the geopolitical tensions. And my third point will be on uh, uh, trade trade from a, a, a really the trade negotiations. The financial services sector is ill served by the uh, infrastructure, by the WTO infrastructure. Financial services is in the same place that agriculture was in the 70s. And it needs a specific approach in order to really liberalize. Right now, there is something called the prudential carve out. Hmm? which can be applied at any moment on anything related to financial services, which means then the opening, the access is totally dependent on regulators, which are not really in the room when negotiating trade. 
So you have these totally different uh, communities that don't really speak to each other and one can pull the, the, the curtain at any moment. Yeah? And I think that needs uh, to, to really change. And the UK has to lead that exercise. It has to be a global exercise. It has to include Asia. It cannot just be a US UK stitch up. It won't work if it's a US UK stitch up, yes? And it has to be regulators. It has to bring financial services regulator into the trade negotiation room in order to be able to codify this prudential carve out and offer a much more stable and predictable trading environment for financial services. Because I will say something about how Gary has portrayed things of saying, oh, the UK has to be, what well, the world's capital has to come to uh, the UK for uh, and go out in the, in the form of UK entrepreneurship. And I will say that I think the UK has to welcome the world's capital to distribute it to the world's entrepreneurs. And for that to happen, it needs market access. And I will stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martina. I've got a couple of follow-up questions that I would like to ask. Um, on your last point, uh, really, on um, uh, governance, um, what do you think is the best mechanism for the UK perhaps to lead in transforming the extent to which financial services are liberated and opened by uh, trade rules. I think we've all seen in the different places we're working, some of the impacts of the prudential carve out, which can feel like a closing down or a protectionism of particularly areas that are ripe for uh, innovation. So what is the best mechanism for us to use in pursuing that as an approach? And secondly, if that is what is going to happen, um, you talked about the UK kicking that off. How do you increase the confidence of the risk aversion that comes from a very good place in the past where we've lived through um, instability within the financial system? How do you increase the confidence of countries to be able to follow where we're trying to point to? So um, I will start very much uh, uh, in a G20 uh, and um, uh, environment because this is where you have both the producers and the consumers of financial services, yes. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that that will be quite a good place to start. Um, I'm thinking very much of the way that the, the upheaval of financial regulation was constructed in the crisis mm -hmm. in 2008 and this type of push, international push that came out in that, case, in that moment from, from the US, from the Obama administration, but uh, uh, and then and the, the, the UK also was really very much there. No? And uh, and um, and try to to then have a collaboration, obviously, with the WTO. If you want this, it's an FSB WTO kind of uh, uh, project. Hmm? Um, think tanks and uh, have a, a very important role to play in the upstream um, elaboration of ideas. Hmm? Because otherwise, if you get directly, it's the kind of thing that uh, you don't want uh, to go directly into. Um, into negotiations because then it becomes very adversarial and it's mm -hmm. very difficult to invent a new. So, in, and then that also happened with the uh, financial regulation. I mean, we had something like uh, the, the whole infrastructure, the whole framework for systemic institutions, the so-called so GCIPs, the big banks, where, where th there was an agreement at the end of how to tackle hmm, um, the spillovers from these institutions at the global level. So this is the approach that I think will be very useful if uh, um, the UK started it. Thank you very much, Martina. I'm now going to turn to uh, Peter. Um, Peter, you've been involved, uh, you've built your career within energy and you're sitting in a company that is going through a major transition itself and has been planning for a pretty major transition for a number of years. Um, I talked in my opening and it's actually, it was a, in the previous panel as well, the extent to which uh, the UK is looking at having a really green building forward, if I'm going to adopt uh, Gary's uh, phrase rather than building uh, back, building forward uh, in a really green way, and has announced a 10-point plan in enabling uh, the UK economy, UK private sector with government support uh, to do that. Um, 
Would you like to make uh, some uh, opening remarks about uh, the UK's prospects in this area and what you think, how you think uh, the areas uh, that we could focus on are going to develop um, in this region uh, and uh, globally? Yes, indeed. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me and thank you to the organisers for, for organising this. Um, I suppose my, my, in my opening sort of couple of minutes, my, my main thesis is that I'm you know, really heartened to see what actually the British government is doing in the, in, in the energy space. Um, I think here for, for climate and for energy generally, I mean, the UK obviously is hosting the, the G7 and then uh, the, the COP26 climate conference later in the year, hopefully, if that goes ahead, which we all hope it will. Um, it's also a key moment because the US is back in the fold in terms of climate action. Uh, China has made significant moves with its own net zero targets, other countries too. So um, so there's a, there's a sort of coming together of a lot of the strands um, of a kind of future energy policy at, at the right time. And I think the, actually the British government is, is playing, uh, seeking to play and is playing a pretty you know, significant role in that. Uh, and I must say, having looked at kind of UK energy policy for, for a long time now um, in, in my role at uh, BP, uh, I, I don't think I've seen such a proactive approach being taken to energy and such a uh, deeply held uh, conviction, actually, about about energy, and it's not often I say that of of any government. So I, I, I do I do think there are some 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 reasons to congratulate the uh, the current UK government on on its stance vis-a-vis -vis climate and, um, and and emissions generally. Um, the ten point plan you alluded to that, Carl. I mean, that's um, obviously a pretty significant statement uh, led you know right from the prime minister around offshore wind and hydrogen and nuclear and uh, electrification uh, and transport jet zero sustainable aviation fuel greener buildings carbon capture and storage the natural environment and of course green finance which we've already touched on so a lot of re really good things in that um, and then I, I think there is a real desire in government to try and build a supply chain because what one of the things that the UK has been very successful on is offshore wind, but we haven't yet really developed our own supply chains around offshore wind, very reliant on, on, on imports and other people. So I think the government's very, very aware that, you know, if we're going to lead this revolution, we're going to have to build our own supply chain so we can start exporting that expertise. And this is giving encouragement, just my sort of final point to companies like mine. I mean, we set a very, very radical strategy last year ch changing from an international oil company really to a an integrated energy company ioc to iec um, with uh, a very strong commitment to net zero by 2050 or or sooner um, and i think uh you know we're very much i think uh the term was used earlier in this greening category look we you know we're, we're not perfect we're still very reliant on oil and gas but we are very clear where we're heading and you know, we will be greening our company uh, quite significantly, including reducing our own production by 40% uh, of oil and gas by, by 2030. And the, the, the climate in the UK and indeed, you know, elsewhere in the world is giving us real encouragement to do that because we have to think about investors, employers and society. And, and I think everybody is coming together now. I think governments, financial markets and companies like mine are coming together. So it's an exciting time. Build back better, build back greener, um, leadership in the green space. I think the, the, these these are all things that uh, you know. I'm sure we'll talk about over the next half hour. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just a question, really. Uh, there's a climate scientist here, British climate scientist, who's um, working here at the moment, Ben Houghton, and he always says, after giving us an absolutely terrifying uh, picture of what the world will look like if you don't manage to bend the emissions curve uh, in the way that uh, Paris mandated or even bend it further, uh, he then says, look, actually, do you know, I've said all of that because we need a sense of urgency, but we also need hope. And the answer is urgency and hope uh, to um, uh, dealing with climate change. Um, for you, in terms of having been involved, like you said, you're in the process of greening within BP. Uh, you still have a lot of your balance sheet, which is dependent on uh, hydrocarbons, but you are enormously invested in uh, future uh, energy models. Um, 
can can you explain to me the extent to which uh, how fast you think the transition can go? Uh, what gives you the optimism that it's going to go as fast as we need it to in order to save our habitats, um, minimize uh, conflict, human uh, disruption, uh, etc., and um, secure sustainability for the planet. What is it that's giving you confidence that we're going to be able to do it sitting from when you're sitting and taking a bit of a look uh, across, the, across the world? Well, I, I mean, confidence, uh, I am getting more and more confident. I think, um, I think we've, we need to get to net zero by 2050 or, or sooner in order to stay within the one and a half degrees. And I, I'm not a climate scientist, but, but that's the sort of the belief that, that, uh, that, that we have. Um, I, I think that if we leave it all till 2049, clearly we're in trouble. So, so we, we've, got, we've got to get going and we've got to make sure that we set these interim targets. It's all very easy to sort of get together and say, right, we'll do this by 2040 or 2045, because none of us will, well, I certainly won't be, won't be around in uh, influencing that then. But um, so I think we've, we've got to get on with it, which is why we've set sort of 2025 targets, 2030 targets. Um, I'm, I'm confident because I think, um, you know, if you look at the three areas, investment, uh, you know, employees and, and, and wider society, everybody's aligned, I think pretty much now, certainly getting aligned that this is, this is an imperative. Um, so, you know, it's not just now the preserve of uh, environmental groups to sort of worry about this and to push. I mean, we, we, we're all in this. Uh, uh, and I think that the, um, that there's no turning back. I mean, if you look at company like ours, I mean, it's extraordinary if you think about it, an oil and gas company saying we're going to produce 40% less of our core product by 20, by 2030. I mean, you know, it's a bit strange, isn't it, really? Like Coke saying they're going to produce 40% less Coca-Cola by 2040, who, by 2030, who, who, who would do that? But that's what we're going to do, and probably sooner than that, because we know if we don't do that, com you know, if companies like mine don't do that, we've got no chance at all. So I suppose I've got the confidence because I'm looking at what we're doing and what other peers are doing. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to invite the audience, uh, please, to add some questions uh, to the uh, or comments to the chat. Uh, Peter uh, has already talked about um, some uh, innovations uh, around digital signaling and how it works on road and it can be uh, used in uh, HTVs uh, as well for local uh, distribution and saving some of our motorways. Please do continue adding questions, please, to the chat. I'm going to um, come back to, uh, to Gary, I think, with my next question, if that's okay. Um, you talked about reinventing financial services, and Martina, you may have a view on this already. Um, so uh, in November, the Chancellor uh, set out his vision for um, financial services and the UK being at the heart of the next generation of financial services. It, um, it, things like fintech, like stablecoin, uh, payments, green finance, many of which you've already uh, mentioned um, today. What are the tangible next steps that we need to be taking to transform uh, financial services? Martina alluded to I think the word you used was arcane, wasn't it? Uh, so in terms of how long the practices that we all operate with have been, a, a, have been there, what are the next tangible steps, Gary, that you think uh, we should be taking? You're on mute, Gary. Oh, yeah, I think there are some very uh, clear tangible ones, uh, but uh, I just, I mean, just a quick vision on the way in which financial services is changing. I mean, and, you know, Peter talking about, uh, they call it the greening of the planet and the pace of which things, but the ideas of open banking, of you know, the rapid movement across, whether it's cryptocurrency or let's think blockchain networks, um, is disenfranchising the established players in the financial services. So, and, I, and we have to pull down <laughs> literally all of the buildings because the concept of the financial services business in the future will be, tr will be very, very different. It will be scattered across a network globally. Now, the, the way in which the UK can take leadership here, it has to fund them. 
And I have a, my, my own son's tried to do something recently. And I'll just give you the anecdote very quickly, but he raised $3 million in order to fund a fintech business in the UK, but they couldn't find a bank to take the money. So they had to deposit it in the United States because number one, a lot of the banks weren't taking new business relationships. And secondly, people weren't aware, the, the banks weren't aware of the VC and PE companies uh, that were putting up the checks. So um, it's a very silly story, but it just shows you that we've got to have a lot more enablement and a lot more support at ground roots level in order to bring this fintech through because the opportunity there is absolutely enormous. So I'm very excited about the way in which the world's changing. The good news is London has been extremely good at fintech. It's had a pause over the last 12 months, but still very good. And secondly, if you talk to any, again, of the younger generation, cryptocurrency is, is almost London-based or UK-based at the moment with so much going on. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I know, I mean, just from my microcosm, um, the extent to which we've had continuing interest, despite all of the challenges that have happened throughout the last year, in looking towards this part of the world, in, in trying to see what are the opportunities for exporting uh, from big companies, from established uh, challenger companies, but also from really small um, uh, fintech disruptors and SMEs, I think that is really, really encouraging. And both uh, you and Martina have talked about China and India, but from where I'm sitting, the kind of population centre and the uh, sustained uh, growth figures in Southeast Asia are interesting in their own right, even if China and India are even bigger in population and market size. Could I ask you a follow-up question though, Gary, on um, skills? So um, we've talked a bit about productivity and uh, you've talked about um, unleashing entrepreneurship. Um, how do you see, and you talked as well about immigration and the role that uh, attracting the best talent into the UK uh, could play to the future of the UK. There's also a question of growing our own skills as well. Um, if you were in charge of uh, developing skills and capabilities uh, within the UK innovation ecosystem, what would you be focusing on? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you go back over the last 20 years, and I don't know the numbers, but it seemed that everyone wanted to get a degree. <laughs> and once you finish your degree now, to be honest, the world's moved on too quickly. You're not so relevant. I think uh, what we need is skills taught at an industry level. And I know that the, the government has started a dialogue about this and there's a lot of good initiatives, but it has to be done desperately quickly. So go, so go back to my son setting up a business, you know, he's now having to go on a course of how to manage people, how to do international finance. These are the things you don't get in a three year course at a university on economics. It just doesn't happen. So I think you know, it's got to be either the business does it or the government's got to sponsor it, but a real skills based education and an accessible one and an effective one is what's needed to accelerate people into the entrepreneurship and being successful because they gain those skills that wouldn't have been taught to them in a standard uh, program of education uh, up to the age of 21. Yeah, I think some of the things that are happening inside our universities on this are really exciting. So no matter what topic you go to discuss, you uh, study at Warwick University, for example, you have to take entrepreneurship alongside that. So even as a historian, as I uh, started my life, I would have had to take entrepreneurship alongside that and working here alongside a universities alliance that we've got here in Singapore we're thinking really hard about how you can put study work experience and practical skills uh, together in a way that speaks to um, future sectors. Uh, Martina I'm going to come back to you you made a statement and said look if I talk to CEOs they've all got India and China in their mind but if you talk to CFOs nobody's thinking about that what can we do to change that? Oh, what what we need to, to change that is uh, uh, increase the ability to uh, access uh, this investor base, yes? And that's uh, both uh, um, a, a pure question of access, yes? And I mean, with China and India, we are, there are both uh, uh, questions of capital controls and policy, but it's also cultural. It's also the, the ability to uh, uh, have a conversation that is not based on the same kind of uh, topics that you will have with the US uh, investor. And uh, not only the, the same topics, but the, the way of approaching it. You know? and, um, 
and so it, it's a it's it's both hard and soft skills yes and hard access and soft skills and uh, for that that's why i think then you need to have this type of uh, initiatives that are uh, uh, involve uh, uh, some bit of reg of regulator uh, dialogue yes and uh, and i was mentioning the, the international governance aspect um, but also uh, um, uh, some type of uh, uh, um, industry initiative. Huh? Then, uh, for example, with corporate treasurers, that will uh, uh, enable them to understand much better these markets. I mean, and it's not just about India and China, you're absolutely right, yes? But this is where the uh, capital is going to grow faster. And so not being able to access that capital in the future is going to be a significant disadvantage companies and uh, okay. capital and know-how because again yeah. think of the uh, digital transformation the 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 regions in the world where it's more interesting and which are better suited to uh, to, to accelerate that transformation is not europe is not the uk is not the us despite what has despite the apples and googles of the world hmm? and so if you want to really uh, uh, use that, you, you need to tilt towards Asia. I don't think there is any other option. And, uh, and capital is a very important uh, lever and uh, channel. Yeah, um, thank you. I should just mention that in the chat, you have a bit of uh, fan mail uh, complimenting you on uh, identification of regulatory discrepancies as being a real barrier to global financial uh, cooperation. It's something that we think about uh, uh, an awful lot as we work with Singapore, uh, including because of Singapore's um, yeah. uh, level of kind of innovation and leadership uh, within this region uh, and can be a standard setter. So. When we're working, for example, on green taxonomy, um, how can we make sure that whatever standards Singapore adopts are going to be as interoperable uh, as uh, they possibly can be uh, with uh, ours? Um, yeah, if I may on that, sorry. Also a, yes. a point, because I think that that's also a very important point for the UK right now, as uh, uh, the, there is a tension between interoperability, uh, uh, convergence of standards and optimum standards. And we are seeing a very strong appetite right now to uh, look at regulation, which is very good, excellent. Huh? But regulators tend to uh, overestimate the benefits of uh, regulation and uh, underestimate the cost of regulatory change and uh, disharmony of standards. Hmm? And so uh, having the perfect green taxonomy is wonderful, except if you are the only country using it. There's no point. Hmm? A taxonomy, it's only good if, uh, if you use the same one than others. And it might be well worth sacrificing less good standard for the same standard. Um, so don't make the best the enemy of the good, yeah. as, uh, as we would say. Um, can I just ask one more follow-up question about how um, a centre like London uh, should be working with Singapore? Uh, you, we have seen increasing um, uh, capital flowing into Singapore, uh, including from around the region, including from China itself. So how, could, how can London and Singapore be a link up into, into the region and increasing financial flows? Or do you think that is a redundant question that is just shows my mental limitations in thinking about geography rather than harnessing some of the um, global revolution that Gary has been setting out? No, I think it's an extremely relevant question because uh, it's uh, Singapore and, and, and London have a, um, uh, to a certain extent very similar roles. Yes, uh, Singapore may be a bit more regionally, but still, huh? and they are both uh, um, uh, global financial centers. Yes, and they, they both have a little bit the Wimbledon effect, yes, in which their financial center serves much more than their economy. And so uh, the similarities are huge. And so you have generally two kind of uh, um, strategies. One, competition, yes, because you are uh, going to try to attract the same uh, 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 capital than uh, um, might be international capital that doesn't stay in the country of origin and the same type of company that is seeking international capital. Hmm? 
or you can have a, a, a more cooperative approach and try to work together in making sure that the world is more open at that level. And so you both benefit. And obviously, a bit like with the China discussion on some things you cooperate and on others you compete, you will have uh, the same. But it should be naturally a very different uh, type of relationship than with countries which are um, uh, which, which do not have this uh, characteristic and which very often have exactly an undersized financial sector rather than an yeah. oversized one. Thank you. Peter, I'm going to come back to you now. So I think really struck uh, by the scale of the transformation challenge that BP has been going through, uh, a member of the audience has asked if you've got any top tips on starting a green journey or actually really accelerating a green journey. Well, I think I think it's a it's a great question. I mean, I think it's there are a couple of things I would say. I think I think first of all, you've you've got to be bold. Um, you know that this is this is a time to to sort of step out of your previous business models. Uh, you know, if if you if you want to change and if you want to affect change, uh, take people with you. Uh, and and you know this is a challenge. You know we are full of uh, reservoir engineers, petroleum engineers, explorers, who have you know built their livelihoods around looking for oil and gas, and and so it's about helping them transition maybe to sort of looking at carbon capture and storage and how a reservoir might operate for the storage of CO2 rather than for the extraction of hydrocarbons or, or getting people to convert from uh, engineering disciplines to building offshore wind farms, you know. So, so I think it's taking employees with you, it's taking uh, investors with you. Um, you know, clearly there's the tension there because on the one hand, we have a lot of pressure rightly from the financial community, DCFD, et cetera, to, to do the right thing as far as uh, the environment's concerned, the missions are concerned. But on the other hand, we're also still expected to produce quarterly dividends and, uh, uh, and quarterly, you know, and, and adequate returns to satisfy the shelves. So we're caught, you know, uh, we're never going to please everybody all the time, but we've clearly got to, 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 to be mindful of what our investors want. And then society. And again, that's about being calm and patient because some, for, for society will never go quickly enough for some people. Uh, and we'll go too quickly for <clears throat> for others. Um, I think do more, talk less. Um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of companies in the past have talked a good book, but possibly not followed it up with investment. And uh, you know, we we are now putting real investment targets, financial targets against our greening agenda, rather than just talking about it. And I'm not criticising the past, but I think I think companies like mine. Others in the past could be accused of maybe talking more than than we did. So actually doing the real projects, which is what we're doing in the UK. I mean, I've never known such growth for BP in the UK. Electrification, offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen. You know, these are all big, you know, big moves that that, that we're making. Uh, but I think patience is the sort of thing. I think I think you've, you know, we've got to get to net zero. We have got to get to net zero by 2050 or sooner. And that's not going to happen overnight, but we've just got to check in all the time that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. So we're coming towards the end of the session. Uh, and I think Duncan has uh, given uh, an idea for a really good uh, final rounding up question. So um, some of what you've talked about is about courage. And I think this is where I abuse my position as being a moderator and being the British High Commissioner. One of the things that I'm proud to represent at the moment in the way that you um, uh, have acknowledged is the fact that in some of the policy documents that we have been issuing recently, there is a real tone of uh, courage, of really going for something, a sense of vision. But in terms of realizing all of the potential of making some of these uh, muscle moves, um, we are going to need a level of international cooperation. And uh, as somebody who started working in the 1990s, I'm not ashamed to admit, uh, uh, that, was a, that was a real high point of feeling that cooperation that hadn't been possible before was suddenly becoming possible, the kind of geographical 
um, uh, canvas on which you were working in terms of international cooperation was broadening. At the moment, there are real geostrategic worries that risk analysts, uh, that governments, that companies are really having to navigate through. So given that we have some of those geostrategic uh, stresses and strains, some of which you have referred to, to what extent, and I'm going to come to each of you uh, going in reverse order, I'm going to start with you, Peter, and uh, go through uh, Martina and finish with Gary. To what extent do you think we can really count on uh, having the level of international cooperation that we really need to find a new version of the optimism that came from a previous um, phase of globalisation? Well, I, I, I think it is, it is difficult to be too optimistic in, in, in that area at the moment. It doesn't feel like the world is moving towards more international cooperation. It, it, feel, it just feels a little bit more fragmented. Um, but I suppose I would, as, as a business person working for a, for a large company, I would say that puts even more importance on companies like mine, just to have the courage of their convictions, of our convictions and invest, do the right thing, invest globally, um, and uh, transport skills and act as a, as, as a sort of lubricant, if you like, for the transfer. I mean, in my case, to, to, to take, you know, the, the greening agenda, agenda we've got in the UK and translate that into other countries, you know, and actually share some learning. So I, th I think it's really important for business, global business to act. Um, and, you know, and I think it's really important that events like the G7 and COP26 Etc. Do their very, very best to bring to bring people together in a spirit of cooperation. Um, thank you. I really like that idea of just doing the right thing and have the courage of your convictions. I think we're working at the moment in this uh, region to encourage more and more uh, companies to sign up to the race to net zero. At the moment, there aren't very many ASEAN headquartered uh, companies that have signed up to that. So please tell your friends, <laughs> Martina. Yeah. I think it's an interesting point. Huh? I mean, uh, uh, the 90s were great for um, uh, international cooperation, but not for international organizations. In fact, the 90s and the 2000s uh, saw the, 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 the many international organizations becoming less and less important, yes? Because countries could speak directly to each other. Right. So in a way, in a, in, a, in a world of conflict, huh? uh, what you need is to, to to go to the third party. And the third party is the international organization. And that's the way you can uh, have your cake and eat it. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, just thinking of one concept, you know, the, the 1930s brought in the concept of GDP and it hasn't served us very well over the last few decades because it's just created a very poor quality of life which we're now fighting. So I just hope that uh, the international um, economists and uh, leadership, and I think they are, think more about the quality of life going forward rather than the pace of life. And maybe the pause of the last 12 months may just to focus minds. I think that's a really opt um, optimistic note. And I went to visit the new headquarters, the new um, sort of Singapore offices of WISE, uh, one of our fantastic uh, kind of tech companies uh, that has come out of the UK and that is operating here in Singapore and across the region. And the feeling that I really got coming away from that, I spent a lot of time with the employees talking to them about the values of the company, the importance of having a really strong purpose. This is what they were saying to me, um, uh, unprompted. Um, and just how motivated they were by the fact that the company put well-being at the heart of their employee offer and also massive amounts of autonomy and control of how they could innovate, how they should work behind a really cl a clearly uh, set out purpose. And the impression that I got from them is that what they were talking about was having a quality of life with a really productive and innovative uh, company. So, so that makes me that makes me feel optimistic. And also on international organizations, to your point, uh, Martina, I think basically having a, a sort of fusion approach, you have to be reaching for every single lever that we've got at the moment. And I think for the UK this year, as you mentioned, Gary, is a really, um, we couldn't have been gifted a better opportunity to demonstrate some global leadership 
at the multilateral uh, level by having both the enormous privilege and burden of delivering a very successful COP26 meeting in Glasgow that like Paris before it six years ago, absolutely transformed how people who want to make money are thinking about how, where they're going to get their uh, future profits. Glasgow has to focus minds in the same way and will only do it by really uh, working with partners who believe in meeting our climate change goals. And also the G7, where there is the possibility of using the G7 to innovate really rapidly with a group of uh, uh, like-minded countries, but also the way that we're going to approach it that is bringing in other countries that uh, sit beyond the G7 to make sure that whatever is being innovated uh, within the G7 grouping is going to be more applicable across a broader set of populations and a broader set of uh, economies. Um, so I would like to thank uh, the panel very much uh, for all of their absolutely fascinating interventions and to the audience for their questions. Um, I'm going to hand it uh, back to you, David. Thank you so much indeed, High Commissioner, for joining us today and for supporting this event again, and especially during this particularly thoughtful week for the High Commission and the UK. Thank you so much for supporting us. And what a fantastic session. Um, thank you to our brilliant panellists, um, our speakers, for their, their valuable insights and opinions today across two hugely insightful and thought-provoking sessions and discussions, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and of course, to our first moderator, um, David Marsh, thank you for that. Um, closing today's webinar, I would now like to hand you over to uh, John Orchard, the CEO of OnFIF, just to say a few words. But before I hand over, a final thank you from me um, to all of our event partners today, uh, to OnFIF, and particularly to the Fry Group as well, for your continued support for this important topic. So John, a very warm welcome. Thank you for your support, and over to you to close. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and thank you to the panelists um, just now and, uh, and earlier on. Thank you, Cara. Um, for a really fantastic uh, moderation of that session. Um, uh, if you like uh, a job doing that full time with OMFIF, you'd be very welcome. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I'd like to wrap, wrap up with a very brief and simple observation, actually. Um, at this time last year, uh, a bank CEO said to me in the midst of the uh, chaos uh, disruption uh, and worry that the crisis would result in uh, what he called positive discontinuities. Uh, uh, he happened to be um, educated uh, as an enarch uh, from Paris. It was the kind of phrase he used. Uh, and I didn't really believe him at the time, um, but I'm certainly starting to now, especially listening to uh, sessions like the one we've just had uh, on how the world economy will navigate um, the Build Back Better agenda, uh, digitization uh, and shifting global economic uh, patterns. A small example is, of course, uh, how we're conducting this session virtually now uh, on, a, on a global basis. Uh, uh, in many ways, a, a useful thing also for, for the Brexit Britain that we've heard described. Uh, although I do confess to looking forward to being in Singapore in person later uh, this year. Uh, we can do both uh, for now. Um, OMFIF doesn't have a nationality uh, and is uh, specifically uh, cross-border, uh, but uh, it's headquartered uh, in the UK. Uh, I thought I've been left uh, a bit more optimistic uh, about the UK's prospects uh, after listening to this discussion today. So thank you very much. Thank you to all our participants uh, and to the British Chambers of Commerce uh, in Singapore. We look forward to seeing you in person soon. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, uh, Tamara Singh and Anjali Lee uh, for setting this up. Uh, and thank you all for listening uh, and see you soon digitally or indeed uh, otherwise. Thank you very much for an excellent session today. <laughs>